Well, welcome to Garden Valley. I am honored you're here this morning. This is a this is a day the Lord's made. We're rejoicing. We're glad in it. So I'm continuing our study. What does God expect of His people? And uh, Dad gave you a handout. And the second page we're not going to cover today. That's your homework. Basically, I went through my computer and I scrounged up everything I could I could find there. And I thought the Samaritans would be a good information for you in case you're curious because the Bible talks about the Samaritans often and I went so far to give you a map yes and uh, there we go kind of tie everything together kind of where everything was laying and what was happening and anyways if you want to know about the Samaritans there's some good information for you and uh, the last week we talked about loving the Lord your God how to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind, how to love God with all of your being. And uh, and I want you to remember, this, to, to me, putting this whole thing in context, you can never miss why Jesus was talking about this. And if we go back <coughs> on your handout, I wrote this out for you, that uh, right in the middle there, it says Luke 10, 25. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him a question, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now, basically, he's asking, to put it in our words today, what do I need to do to be saved? You know, how, how can I have eternal life? How do I get saved? How does... And so, basically, don't ever forget that everything that happens after this is Jesus answering this question. And uh, I think this is incredibly important. Because if you look in the next verse, verse 26, Jesus said, well, what does the law of Moses say? How, how, have you read it? He's asking a guy that's an expert on religious law if he's bothered to read the law, you know. And uh, so I think they're a little tongue-in-cheek here. I think maybe goading him just a little bit. And uh, and the guy, he has the answers. But remember we started out talking about the cross, about how our relationship with God needs to be right. And that's where we start. We start with who I am before God, who God is in an accurate way, and when we grasp these concepts, the more we grasp these concepts, the more we have the love of God flowing through us and it will affect our relationships. We should never forget, I believe the litmus test on how we are doing in our relationship with God is reflected in our relationships with other people. Because the Bible teaches us in 1 John that God is love. And if we don't love other people, then we don't have the love of God in us. And so what happens, God flows, God's love flows through us and reaches out. It's not like, remember the old saying where you get all you can, put it in a can, and sit on the can? That's not the concept of God and God's love. He wants it to flow through us and impact other people. The gifts, the abilities, the love, the things that God gives us, he is bestowing on us to what? Flow out and impact other people. And so basically, if you read this, he's saying, what do I do in here eternal life? And he said, well, what does, what does the law say? He said, well, love God. And what does he say? Love your neighbor as yourself. So when I look at this, I reckon, by the way, when I go back here to Johnny Money's picture, there we go. But I come back here, one of the things that I appreciate Garden Valley Community Church is how faithful this church is Amen. in supporting, loving other people. Amen. You're never going to need anybody from this town. You're never, but what? We can be faithful in praying for them. Praying that God will push back the, the, the area of darkness, the, the workers of darkness, the people that are oppressive, the people that are uh, fighting against the gospel of Jesus Christ, and pray a hedge of blessing around the ministers that are going into this area to preach the gospel. And so when I do this, we are loving your neighbor as your son. And the first thing I like to do when I read this every single time is I say, okay, for me to understand the concept of how to love my neighbor as myself, well, how do I love myself? I mean, exactly, what, how, what does this look like? Or, okay, it's important to me not to... <laughs> Think about it. How, what do I do? Self-preservation. Self, to, to push ahead in my career, to push ahead in my finances, to push ahead. And I begin to recognize 
that everything I'm talking about is selfish. <laughs> as, I, as I begin to do this, I recognize that I'm turning the very best that God has out there and pouring it into myself and keeping it, where that is the exact opposite of the love of God. Now I brought you to the definition at the top of the page. Top of the page, this is where I was going with this. I gave you a definition of God's love. This is not the perfect definition. This is just kind of how I understand it. Okay, this is the way your pastor, when I think of God's love, I, I think of giving someone what they need the most, when they deserve it the least, a great personal cost to you without getting anything in return. That's about, that's, that is that is love. That is pouring out. There's nothing selfish about it. There's nothing, what? That is taking the very best that I have and bestowing it on somebody else. Intentionally spreading grace to other people. Intentionally spreading grace to other people. Taking the love of God and sharing it. And, I, and that first line, and by the way, each one of these, I, I pray it for years, I've been praying about this, giving someone what they need the most. That may be what you and I would think about as tough love. Giving someone what they need the most, where we're honest with them, where we're, <laughs> this morning, uh, <clears throat> I had someone reach out to me, um, actually in a text, a dear friend reached out to me in a text, and uh, one of her neighbors was involved in a domestic dispute last night, and there was kids involved, and it was a very, it was a bad situation. And so she was wanting uh, me to pray with them, and she's, she was really concerned about this single mom, and what was going to happen. And finally I told her, I says, I want you just to shift your perspective a hair from defeat to what God was able to do in the life of the prodigal son. The prodigal son was only willing to turn to God when he had reached a point in his life where he had no more answers. When he had reached in a point of destitute, when he reached a point of... He, he, he had he, what we say he tied a knot in the end of the rope and was just hanging on. All right, He reached the end of the rope. And so here I, I was encouraging my friend to pray to that end, that, that this point, that this dear lady would recognize that God is the only one that can heal. God is the only one with the answers. <coughs> and much like the prodigal son, she's reached a point to where it is time for her to have a relationship with God and to, to quit running from Him. And so when I read this, this is one of the things, giving someone what they need the most. When I, uh, and by the way, there's no blanket answer to this. Giving someone what they need the most. When uh, when I'm working with people in grief, when they're dealing with grief, what do I do? I don't preach them sermons. <laughs> because when they're in grief, they're traveling a path where they need to go, when they need to go, they're addressing what they need to address. And it, it's really confusing because when they're dealing with grief, they're probably going to go through some anger and then they're going to go through some other things. And then just when they think they're getting a grip on it, then they'll come back to anger and they'll kind of circle back around and they'll hit the same things. And at some point, they need somebody that'll just walk beside them, be their companion, and just let them grow and heal and deal with things as their heart needs to deal with it. Giving someone what they need the most. Um, <laughs> another illustration for this, giving someone what they need the most. Um, <laughs> I learned this in Bible college. Um, I remember the, the professor that was teaching pastoral counseling took that class. It was a two-year class in uh, pastoral counseling. Um, one of the things he taught us was he says, people are going to come to you for counsel. And 90% of them are just going to want you to agree with where they're at and what they're doing. And they're just going to want you to sign off and endorse what they want. And they said at 10%, are actually going to want you to bestow some counsel. And so I remember throughout the, those two-year course that I took, the, 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 he was always coming back to the fact that it's wise to give people the Word of God. When they come and they ask you something, <laughs> this is like one of my favorite illustrations, and I actually know the people involved, and you do not. But um, the, 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 this lady went to her pastor, who's a dear friend of mine, and told him that uh, God had led her to a man that she was supposed to marry. The problem is she was already married to somebody else. And uh, she'd met this guy at church at a potluck. And um, I remember he told me, he says, 
I, I opened my Bible and says, well, here's what God says. And she says, no, God told me. So basically she's saying, well, what God told me supersedes what the Word of God says. And um, he's like, no, 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 no. God is not going to bless this. And so, but she'd already made up her mind that she went to the pastor for the sole purpose of getting him to agree with what she wanted. And uh, I, I never forget that. When people come with me, come to me for uh, counsel, and especially on things of the heart, often I'll just open my Bible and I'll say, okay, here's what the Bible says, and I'm giving them what they need the most. Even, I won't cram it down their throats. I will give them what the Bible says, and I'll say, all right, you need to go home and pray about this. You need to go, Calvin and I talked about this, give them a passage of Scripture, say, go home and pray about it every day, and then in a week, come back. You know, in seven days, ten days, come back, and we will sit down, and I want you to explain to me what God revealed to you from this passage of Scripture, because what you're asking is found in here. Give someone what they need the most. That's love. What is not love is telling someone what they want to hear just to get rid of them. Uh, I have a dear friend, and um, he would be so offended if he knew I was using him as a sermon illustration. And now I'm going to call him and tell him. And... Um, <laughs> And he was, he was quite famous or infamous for uh, coming and he would start asking his friends, what do you think I should do in this situation? Well, he already knew what he was going to do, but he wanted somebody else to sign off on it. So he'd come to me and say, what do you think about it? And I'd say, no, that's stupid. No, don't do that or you're going to get hurt. And uh, so then he'd go ask somebody else, say, so what do you think I should do in this? No, don't do this. And he'd go through his whole list of friends, and when he got to the end and everybody said no, then he'd come back to me. Listen, I've been praying about this, and I've been reading the Bible, and I think, I was like, no. And so then eventually he would just kind of keep asking people until finally he encountered somebody that was not his friend that would say, oh, yeah, yeah, fine. If you think that's what you should do, do it. And angels would sing, candles Messiah. All of a sudden, the windows of heaven opened, and he got to do what he wanted to do in the first place. That is not giving someone what they need. That's giving them what they want. There's a difference here. When it says, love your neighbor as yourself, that means you're giving this person, this person that you encounter, what they need, not what they want. Uh, when they deserve it the least, oh, now we're talking about acting like Jesus. We're talking about where he chose to love. Not Romans. Oh, man. There's a book of Romans. It's just full of passion. What does it say? But God demonstrated his love. God demonstrated his love for you in that while you were yet sinner, Christ died for you. That is the very definition of giving someone something that they need when they don't deserve it. That is the definition of what Jesus did for us. A great personal cost, greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friend, and not getting any none of this. <laughs> no, not getting any applause, not getting any recognition. Not, no, working behind the scenes. So then, it, it, I highlighted right in the middle of the page. And who is my neighbor? We cannot address this passage of scripture without addressing. Well, who's my neighbor? Says, uh, okay, if it's only going to be within a what a, a quarter mile radius of me, then I'm only responsible for the people in that this little area right here, right? That is not what he's saying. He says, love your neighbor yourself. Okay, there's my <laughs> to use uh, attorney words. That's a weasel clause. Okay, so uh, so if they live on the other side of the river, does that exclude them from me and my neighbor? Yeah, wiggle room. <laughs> my my definition of this is a divine appointment. Your neighbor is anybody that God brings into your path. Amen. Anybody that God brings in an encounter with you, He has prepared you for this encounter for the extent that He wants you to deal with them. And so if you think about this, a divine appointment is where God says, I'm going to bring somebody into your life that I want you to, and it might just in a, some sense give them a hug. It might be just listening to them. It might be just offering a passage of Scripture. I'll tell you something that my dad and mom have taught me is um, one of the most powerful things that you can do here is have a word of prayer with them. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have never, ever, ever had anybody tell me I cannot pray for them. Um, I, we're talking, I do this a lot. Um, whether they're in grief or whether they're... Make a, I've done this in jail. 
remember 20 years in jail, you have plenty of opportunities to pray with folks. And uh, I've never once had anyone in the jail tell me, no, you cannot pray for me. They may struggle. They may struggle to accept this whole God thing. Matter of fact, um, somebody from the immediate area got a hold of me this week because he's struggling, quote, I don't know about that whole God thing. What can I do? Then I can pray with, for him. I can pray with him. I can refer him to somebody that could uh, invest the time in the Bible. He needs to do a Bible study, frankly, to teach him how to get into the Word of God, dig things out of the Word of God, and how to, how to learn who God is. Yeah? The more he gets to know God, the more he will trust him, the more he will be able to have a relationship with him. <coughs> so who is my neighbor? Who is God leading into your path? Who is it? Okay, flip your little paper over. All right, flip your paper over. i got to keep moving. I'm never going to get done. Cause I love this topic. Because if you read the book of James, Calvin and I talk about that. It's the book of James. You know, faith without works is dead. What is that doing? Listen, it's not saying to work for your faith. It's saying that if your faith is authentic, if what you believe is authentic, it will impact your relationships. If your faith is authentic, if, if what you say and what you believe is true, then it will be reflected in your contact with other people. So anyways, like that, digging deep is what I call this. Number one, anyone is your neighbor. And notice, Jesus is now telling a story of a man who sacrifices. And by the way, this is what I would call the second most famous uh, parable. Yeah? Probably the most famous parable, the most well-known, recognized, is probably the prodigal son. Um, they make movies about the prodigal son. That is very, but the, the good Samaritan, he's probably right in there a very close second. This whole passage in here is incredibly powerful. And i got a couple minutes, I'm just going to read it for you. So on your little handout there, I'm just going to read through this quickly. Verse 30, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. And they stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. Verse 31, by chance a priest come along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. <coughs> 32, a temple assistant walked over, looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side of the road. He's what we call an EMS uh, rubbernecker. He, want, he wants to see some carnage, but he doesn't want to get his hands dirty. Verse 33, then a despised Samaritan come along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion. Now, this is beginning to tell us a lot about the priest. Huh? Verse 34, going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds. Olive oil and wine managed him. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. Verse 35, the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man, and if his bill runs higher than this, I will pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, all right, now go do it yourself. Yeah. All right. So who is your neighbor? Jesus he is telling the story about a man who sacrifices to provide help for somebody of a different race, a different religion, somebody he doesn't even know, a whole different family line. There is absolutely no reason for this Samaritan to get involved with this guy. This guy that's laying in a ditch beaten and bruised, probably, good chance, would not have done the same for the Samaritan. All right? Get this. This was a one-way one street we're talking about here. Because this guy is... He's a, and I, I've used this illustration before. If a Jew had to walk through Samaria, if a Jew had to walk through the area, he would get Samaritan dust on his sandals. And they believed that when they got to the edge of Samaria, they had to stop and kick the dust and dirt off of their sandals because they didn't want to be contaminated with the, with the dirt from these, well, they call them half-breeds. They were the, the Samaritans, they... They were kind of a little hodgepodge group from different, and uh, I gave you some information on that. You can read about that at your own leisure. Keep going. Number two, what is, a, what is this story teaching us? To provide practical and material help to those in need. And this is something that I'm very proud to say our church is very generous with. You've given me the freedom when somebody is in need. And by the way, 
you know, my dad taught me this. When someone is in need, I, I, I am very careful with the God's money. With the tithe money of the Lord, I'm very careful with it. I'm not, I'm not loose with it. I'm not frivolous with it. And, uh, okay, I get to tell a quick story. When I was a kid, and I mean, I wasn't very old, my dad was a deacon in the church in Colorado. <coughs> And I remember uh, Dad on this deacon, one of his uh, responsibilities was when indigent people, people in need, would come to the church for help, Dad would go to their house and go through their cupboards and go through their refrigerator. And I remember he would go to the house and make sure that they were actually in need and that's trying not to calm the church out of tithe money. And I remember Dad going through their cupboards saying, eh, well, there's not much in here, and going through the fridge. You know? So then we would actually go to the Safeway and he'd buy bags of groceries and potatoes and eggs. We would buy staples. And Dad would get the what people would need to feed their family. We would go back and, and what we would provide for the people in need. What did that do? That, that taught me that I was not to minister to the gospel of Jesus Christ to them until I had filled their bellies with food, made sure that they were hungry, made sure their lights are on, made sure they got heat in the house, made sure they had gas in their tank. And once those things had been done, then and only then, we'd say, all right, listen, we are from Garden Valley Community Church. And as a church, listen, we love people. The love of God flows through us, and He has given us the ability. He's been incredibly generous with us where we can reach out and help people like you. And uh, you'd be shocked how often it opens the door for us to continue ministering or to invite them to church. And at the very least, at the very least, it, uh, it offers a time for me to say, hey, can I pray with you? Before I go, can we just take a moment, just have a word of prayer? And uh, this is the practical material help. Proverbs has a lot to say about this. <clears throat> All right, go to number three. Lesson, meet the needs in the name of Jesus. Meet the needs in the name of Jesus. Listen. We want people to know that the love of God is flowing through us. We want people... <laughs> when, I, when I do funerals, one of the things that I go out of my way to do is instead of doing grief counseling a lot of times, all I'm going to do is I'll just... You try to assess and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's lead. You try to use discernment. And as people are coming up and giving you a hug, I'm just saying, listen, God loves you. You are not alone. Why? The, the Psalm 23 says what? Listen, you are with me. Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because I'm not having to do this alone. So I will tell people, listen, God loves you. You're not having to do this by yourself. That's it. Just tell them God loves them. Remind them that, hey, there is someone bigger, stronger, more powerful that can provide your needs where you're at, what you're struggling with. He knows your innermost thoughts. You're not alone. So when I'm doing the good deeds, when I'm meeting the physical needs of other people, and by the way, let me get half a step further on this. I know I've lost track. How many people that I have met needs of people whose power's been turned off or whatever their problem is, and uh, take take some money from the church, and I'll go, go to their house, and uh, I'll say, listen, God loves you. We're God's people, and all we're doing is God has given us the ability to meet your needs. One of the things I recognize is I'll probably never, ever, ever see him, see him again or hear from him again. Why? I like to think of it as a, as a race. I like to think of it as a marathon. And I am carrying a baton from here to the door. And then I'm going to hand it off to the next guy who's going to run another leg of the race, and he's going to hand off the baton to the next person. And God will bring people into their life to minister to them, to love them, to meet their needs, to let them experience the love of God in real life, in real time, and which should soften their hearts and soften their minds. But it's a way of processing that soil. Remember the soil illustration? It's probably the third most famous illustration in our parable. And so all of a sudden, the soil is being tilled in the hardness of their heart heart and everything that they believed about religion and about God all of a sudden is being they're calling into question as the people of God are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're loving people unconditionally, meeting their needs unconditionally, asking for nothing in return, not asking for applause, not asking no. 
Just letting the love of God flow. This is powerful. This is incredibly powerful. Make sure people know that what you are doing, you're doing it in the name of Jesus. Listen. Keep going. Number four. Does a good Samaritan remind you of anyone? Ah, there we go. Does it, because when I read the story of the Good Samaritan, immediately, 100% of the time, my, my heart goes back to when I was a kid and my dad was going around meeting the needs of indigent people in the name of Jesus working through the church. When, uh, when, when does a Good Samaritan... By the way, I can give you lists. Um, one of them that comes to mind really quick, uh, was, was it last year? The year before last, we had some good snowstorms out here. My blade on my pickup was broke, and uh, a, a Christian friend of Jana's, nice guy, brought his pickup out here and plowed me and the church out. And uh, and uh, when when I went to pay him, what does he say? He said, "No, I consider this my tithe." Plowing out the church. No, he what? He's doing it in the name of Jesus. He was meeting a need that needed to be met. He was serving the people. What? When I think about somebody that's a good Samaritan, all of a sudden my heart begins to expand because I recognize the people in this room and the ministry that they have had in this community. And so I gave you notice, someone who has actually did something to meet a need with no thought of personal gain or recognition. Is that awesome? And so just to tie this whole thing together, I gave you a verse at the very bottom. <clears throat> because I think this verse will challenge your heart. I think Genesis 127, where it said, every human is made in the image of God. Everyone is made in the image of God. So what does that mean? That means in the eyes of God, every person has value, and each is worthy of our help. What does that stop me from doing? That's, if, if you keep this verse in mind, be, they're made in the image of God, it will stop me from judging them, it will stop me from drawing preconcerned presupposition. It'll stop me from judging, criticizing. Why? Because I learned when I <laughs> there was a family in the uh, by the panorama trailer park in Kettle, um, and uh, they were there. They were in an RV and they were broke down. They were out of gas. They didn't have power in the middle of the winter. They were cold. And the church was kind enough to, to, I knew how much they needed to get the repair, to get the, some power, to get moving down the road, get some gas. And so I, I took him a check. And I remember this because as I'm handing him the check, the thing that went through my mind that I'll never forget, I'm handing him the check, and what I kept thinking was, I will never hear from these people again. This is pure ministry. This is casting my bread on the water, knowing that uh, God is going to do what He's going to do, and all I am is I am just a servant. I'm just here to meet at one need, and uh, I never heard from him again, never saw him again. They were gone down the road, uh, getting to where they needed to be. They were moving their family. But God was able to use this church in the capacity of the Good Samaritan. <coughs> Trust me, those people will never the rest of their lives forget the goodness and kindness and grace of the Garden Valley Community Church in meeting the need when they had nothing to offer. There was nothing in their life that they could bring to the table and say, well, you do this for us, we'll do this for you. No, they had nothing. They were out of food, they were out of gas, they were broke down. You start making a list. They couldn't even pay for their lot rent where they were parked at. And so what? We were able to reach out, minister, and kind of in a sense, being an angel anonymous. Yeah. Meet that's a, that's people's need. Pardon? Excuse me, I just burned it. That's a covenant relationship. That's a covenant relationship. Yes. Amen. Between us yep. and the people we're helping, yep. or the people that help us, yep. and God's with His command. And that lasts forever, by the yep. way. I have learned that uh, when I go to do some, and by the way, this is very practical. When I go to give somebody, especially if it's money, if I go to give a gift to somebody in need, I have learned that I have to have enough faith to trust that God will pursue that money, pursue their hearts, and have a purpose for it, and that it is not my responsibility to make sure they invest that wisely. Now this is a big pill to swallow, because they are not accountable to me, they're accountable to God. All right, This is one of those things where I have to release it and let it go, 
can say, I have been faithful with what God has called me to do, who He's called me to do it with, and my mission here, my ministry here, is to let go and let God move them where they need to be. Just my leg of the race. And my challenge to you is as you love God, He will change your heart. He will fill your heart with His love, with His grace, with His mercy, and it will reflect in your relationships. And if you want to know where you stand in all this, look at your capacity to meet people in their needs and look and say, listen, the only people I help, people that I approve of, or are the people that I help people that I trust, or the only people I help people that are close to me within my circle of friends, or do you ever exercise your faith and step outside of your comfort zone, because if you read your Old Testament especially, every time God called somebody to do something great, He always moved them out of their comfort zone. He always challenged their faith, and in that moment of challenge is when your faith will grow. In that moment of faith, when you're being challenged to get out of your comfort zone, to reach out into lives, all of a sudden you are taking what we call a leap of faith. All of a sudden you have no safety net. You say, I am going to serve. And <laughs> tell you one stupid story and I'll wrap this up. There was a lady that went to church here when I started here. And then Shelly. She lived right over here in a, in a little house. I love Shelly. She was so sweet. She moved to Utah, I think, eventually. But anyway... Shelly, uh, she asked the church, she says, my house is cold, the house is still there. She said, my house is cold and I have no wood. I need some heat. And uh, so we're like, we men, we're church men. We're going to go meet this need. And so the church guys, you know, we all butt tight on our capes and got our gloves and we're all excited. And so uh, we got a bunch of firewood delivered for her and we're going to go out there and cut it and split it. And, and I remember Everett Jolly, one of our church elders, Got his thumb in the, the automatic splitting thing. You know? Got his thumb in there, split his thumb, crushed the bone, and take him to the hospital. And uh, we get inside that. There's no insulation in that house. None. It's like a little clapboard house. Come out, she had two furnaces, two wood heaters in there, and uh, six cord of wood. You'd probably get her through a month, month and a half. And so the heat men of the church all of a sudden realized that we were leaping by faith and we were going to be cutting wood all winter. And. Uh, <laughs> The love of God constrains. The love of God moves me. The love of God urges me forward. And uh, a lot of times the love of God is reflected in your relationships, in people that either you don't approve of, Samaritan, meeting the needs of a Jew, different race, different... Make a list. He was way out of his comfort zone. And that is where God will call you to serve more.